AMD's FX series of processors. Well, they've got an awful reputation. They were hot, they were slow, and they were heavy. And then they were absolutely obliterated by Ryzen and Intel's Core series. But now, over a decade later, just how well are they coping? And was there ever an exception to this rule? Now, today's video is a bit of a nostalgic one, but we also have a bit of a weird point to prove today, as when I started this channel, it was all ran from an AMD processor, and not one that many people look on favourably, and that processor was AMD's FX4300, one of the cheapest processors they offered around the time, and one of the FX processors that's gone very much under the radar, as, you know, I built my first decent PC with one of these, and that decent is in inverted commas here. Because before this, I was using a Pentium 4 system, and as much as I loved it, well, it was certainly beginning to struggle. Even if it did have a Radeon X800 with it, but that really is a story for another day. So, why the FX4300? Well, while we get all this set up, why don't I tell you why this process has gone forgotten, and why, at the time, it was a surprisingly good chip that has since fallen from grace spectacularly, at least in the eyes of consumers. Released in late 2012, the AMD FX4300 was part of a refresh series that brought about processors like the FX6300 that everybody seemed to use at the time, and the FX8350 that those that couldn't afford Intel opted for, two processors with their own stories that have been far more covered than this one has. And reviews at the time of the launch, well, they were mediocre. That is, if you can find any reviews, genuinely, it seems that most have vanished from the internet other than the one review that I read of this all that time ago. And that's what I mean when I say this thing went under the radar. But the reality is the story that I personally can tell you because I am someone that bought this processor. On release, it was pitched as being too close in price to AMD's 6 core, the 6300, and worse than Intel's Core i3 in certain tasks. And it wasn't long after this, in 2013, that Intel realised that they were vastly on top, and you couldn't even begin to find any decent Sandy Bridge parts under £100. They were really expensive around this time, the Intel stuff. And genuinely, this AMD FX chip was the only thing in real budget territory especially for someone such as myself that didn't have much money at the time, but wanted something better than his Pentium 4, and was a bit scared by the used options of the era. I mean, most people that haven't built a PC before don't really want to use used parts. So I had two options. Spend even more money buying an Intel motherboard and their cheapest processor, the Celeron, or buy the even cheaper AMD FX4300 for just £52, and a rather nice Asus motherboard for about £40. See, that's where FX shined. In the real world, it was completely destroyed by Intel, we all know that. But back then, these things were priced dirt cheap. As in, you only got a Celeron from Intel, but here, you got offered a lot more than one of those vegetables. And so, like many people, I ended up with an AMD FX series processor, the FX4300 once again. As I couldn't afford the 6-core, I certainly couldn't afford the 8-core, and I knew Intel Celerons weren't good. And it lasted me all the way through till Skylake and then eventually Ryzen. But after having recently bought back my original PC, that's right, for this video we are using the original Budget Builds PC of 2013, oddly fitting given this is our 200th video, and it got me wondering, we saw, just a couple of weeks ago, just how well Intel's old processors are holding up. We looked at the i7-860, and it's still doing good. But all we ever hear about AMD's FX was how awful it was. And I just can't remember this little 4-core, because yes, despite the lawsuit, this thing does actually have 4-cores on a technical level, ever doing too badly. And after all, it's got to be holding up against its Intel equivalent, which was a Celeron. So what exactly did £50 12 years ago get you in terms of specs on what was an entry-level processor? <laughs> 
AMD's FX4300 comes in based on the pile driver architecture, namely the Vashira revision, which is mostly just a revision of Bulldozer. It's on a 32 nanometer Global Foundries node, which sounds ancient by today's standards, and has four cores, four threads, and clocks in at a base speed of 3.8 gigahertz. But mostly, all FX chips could go a lot higher than this. I doubt you'll find one that's ever been round at its stock speeds, because on the original cooler, which was actually just a slab of aluminium with a fan whacked on top, you never got copper here in the UK if you ordered it from Amazon, CPC or somewhere like that, you could hit decent clock speeds, usually 4.4 or 4.5 guaranteed. It does have 4 megabytes of L2 and L3 cache, however the controversy here is the cache is shared between the cores which is where the whole lawsuit nonsense comes from. Weird thing to do, but they act like four cores, and in most tasks the architecture itself is more of an issue than the cache being shared. It uses around 97 watts under full load, and costs about £10 today, which is a bit steep given that you can get a lot of processors a lot cheaper than this. I mean, we picked up an i7 for 75p, so they've sort of held their value, which is weird given this was a budget processor. But there isn't much point hanging around anymore, because in reality, we all want to know just how well the FX line is holding up, especially on its lowest end. And let me just say these benchmarks are a surprise, especially for me. Now remember, we are testing a CPU, so all benchmarks are ran for stressing only the processor, and you're going to enjoy seeing it maxed out in everything possible just to see it try and make some frames. So please enjoy some rather surprising performance from the FX4300 in the benchmarks. Starting off the benchmarks right into the deep end, we have Red Dead Redemption 2, which ran surprisingly well. In a combination of the built-in benchmark and actually just playing the game, we saw around 44 FPS on average, with the occasional drop down to the mid-20s when things got very intensive, which was mostly during the built-in benchmark. But other than that, it ran pretty smooth. I actually wasn't expecting this level of performance at all, and it caught me off guard given this was the first test we decided to do. Perhaps it's the DirectX 12 magic going on, but given that this has half the core count of the consoles, yet it's still managing what I can only call decent frame rates matching that of later Core i5 chips, these FX series processors may have only ever been average, but they're managing that same average level of performance 12 years later on and this is only the first benchmark. Next up on the list with another new one is Baldur's Gate 3, which ran pretty much the same in other DirectX 11 or Vulkan, and it had an average in the mid 40s a lot of the time, occasionally going up to the high 50s when not much was going on. There wasn't too much in the way of sporadic performance and it certainly wasn't unstable, and throughout the entire intro it wasn't unplayable at all. For a game that can really go to town on a lot of processors, it was a good experience. Generally through most of the intro there was no hitching other than when cutscenes loaded, and once again I was caught off guard by the level of performance we're apparently still getting out of a budget processor from the last decade. GTA 5 runs about the same as I remember it did on launch, hitting 60 FPS when not much was going on, but generally dropping around to the high 40s and low 50s the moment you were moving around the city or doing something. Which is strange because the performance here isn't actually too dissimilar from Red Dead Redemption 2, which we usually don't see much when testing processors. Still, it was nice to see that even with Battle Eye running, the performance here on the FX chip is decent. I mean, it's not really changed from how it was on launch. I remember actually stealing 2GB more RAM out my parents PC just to get up to 6GB of RAM back in the day to make the thing actually stop stuttering. Good times. Unlike the world of GTA Online, where now in lobbies over 16 players you are now relegated to around 30fps most of the time. Not bad, and there is certainly less slowdown than the Jaguar based consoles with a lot less pop in but performance nowadays is definitely suffering. Not yet to unplayable levels, and with GTA 6 on the way, I can't imagine too much will be changing to actually take away from this. So at least this little budget CPU has somehow managed to keep up with the most popular title of its lifetime, even if the frame rate is now a bit more cinematic. Smaller lobbies do still run better, somewhere in between single player and the last benchmark. It's also good to know that even with Battle I now employed, 
well, it didn't actually stop a hacker making my screen this weird hue, so there's not much I can do about that, that's just the colour of this benchmark now. And honestly, if you're still on an FX4300 trying to play GTA Online, stick to under 16 players and it's still a pretty smooth experience. Counter-Strike 2 ran alright. I wouldn't go as far as to call it good, as I swear we used to see well over 100 FPS back in the day in the earlier builds of Counter-Strike GO, with this here, you know, FX4300 even, and maybe a legacy port should be on the cards, because that would be nice to test, but still, here, in the latest and apparently greatest of the FPS franchise, we saw mostly above 60 FPS during both the benchmark and in-game. Competitive frame rates could be about 10 FPS or so higher, but it's not really what I would call a competitive experience, so maybe if you want to get into the world of CS2 competitive gameplay, don't keep using your FX4300. BeamNG was another fun one to test, as much like the i7 we saw a few weeks ago, and this is not a comparison I ever thought I'd be making with an FX chip, it took an awful lot to make it struggle here. Running the game without any AI or in simpler maps would result in a flawless experience with no slowdown and a frame rate well over 60 FPS. In the end, to actually make this thing struggle, we had to turn on all the AI, use an intensive map, and then have the AI chase us around to actually put some load on things. There could still be some dips down to the high teens when all the foliage and AI was being processed, but most of the time, it was still a perfectly serviceable experience, and not one I ever thought I'd see running on an FX series chip, especially on the low end. So BeamNG still runs fine on the FX series. Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord also held its own really well, seeing over 100 FPS during larger battles and the game's built-in benchmark. Really large endgame stuff could of course cause rather long load times, but once it actually all loaded in, it still ran very smoothly. Given that I used to mostly spend my time running Warband when I actually used this processor, it was nice to see that its successor is also no problem even towards the late game, and with that competent multi-threading, dare I say it actually runs better than Warband in some places. RimWorld is a highly single-threaded game, but I'm sure we all know that by now. And the frame rate rarely matters here, as what actually counts is the game's internal tick rate. And during a mid-game colony, well, there weren't too many problems at three times speed, but going up to four times speed saw very little increase to the tick rate. Really, you know, you're exceeding core two duo levels of performance here because that is what the FX performs like when you aren't using all of the processor. And it didn't matter what chip you use here, you will probably see the same performance from even an FX8350 as you're seeing here. When it comes to titles like this, FX never really stood a chance. And here today in 2024, well, it's playable, but I really don't think I'd want to play a colony into the late game on a processor like this. The same also extends over to the modern world of indie games with things like Tavern Keeper, which see poor performance all around, with it only using two cores of RFX chip, resulting in, and you guessed it, Core 2 Duo-like performance. It's a real shame when games can't use all of the FX chip, as suddenly you go from seeing excellent performance in even games like Red Dead 2 and Baldur's Gate 3, to an experience that feels slow and bloated, with half the processor doing absolutely nothing. Finally though, we had the final release of Minecraft, just to see how things are holding up there, and I can safely say without a doubt that it's still not an issue, after what has been a decade of updates. We saw well over 300 FPS a lot of the time with fancy settings used and a good render distance as well. I know it's a bit of a silly benchmark because it is Minecraft, and I've always found the FX series has done oddly well here when it shouldn't have. Maybe it's because I was used to running a Pentium 4 before this, but there certainly isn't an issue with running Minecraft with well over 100 FPS. That's pretty good, actually. So there we have the benchmarks on the FX4300 over 12 years later. And to my amazement, well, I can't say it's performing better than ever, but it's certainly performing exactly the same as it did from all that time ago. And maybe this does explain something. The huge push from AMD in that era was for games to pivot over to Mantle, which was the predecessor for technologies like Vulkan and DirectX 12. And as much as they pushed it for the graphics card side of things, 
It seems like more than ever, it's actually helping out these old processors more, and they're actually getting utilised at last, and that goes beyond their flawed designs. Yet all we ever heard about is the advantage to graphics cards, negating that this technology is the fine wine that keeps AMD's FX still somehow clinging on to life, a cheap Celeron equivalent matching older i7s and newer i5s in performance is not something I was ever expecting, especially from a CPU that I left in the dust back when the Skylake refreshes started. And over in the world of modern day usage, well it's certainly not slow. It feels about the same as a Core 2 Quad does, nowhere near as fast as Intel's Nahalem i7s or Sandy Bridge i5s do, but it holds up well enough with an SSD that you can more than happily multitask and do whatever it is you need to do, all the while you browse the web, watch videos, install stuff. It doesn't matter what you're doing, it seems to manage fine here. I mean if you care about power consumption, maybe a cheap Sandy i5 would make sense, but other than that... You know, I'm not going to say go out and buy an FX chip if you want to browse the web, that is just ridiculous. But they haven't stopped being usable yet. Just for old time's sake, I did actually install my video editor, which is Serif Movie Plus X6, and yes it's old, but I still use it today, and it brought back the full FX experience that got me into making videos in the first place. With performance that was very slow in places, especially when using multiple layers and heavily single-threaded effects. But when it came time to actually render things out, and you can utilise all four of those cores, it was slow, but it was still serviceable. This test doesn't actually serve any part of the review other than a little trip down memory lane. So, you know, it still works for video editing, but we've come a long way for tasks like that. And at this point, I was really running out of things to test. I did do some synthetic benchmarks, and they run fine on the processor. Time Spy and Still Nomad both indicate that even the low end of RTX cards is really pushing things. But, you know, I used to run this with a HD7770 or an R9285. But that is one of these things that sort of lets me ramble on about. Compatibility. I've always found the AM3 stuff just seems to work. It doesn't matter what RAM you throw at it, like this cheap stuff from Amazon, it loads up and it works. You can throw in a modern RTX graphics card, which can be awfully picky with this era of motherboards, and they always seem to work. AMD's FX was never good, but you got some quality motherboards at cut rate prices, and it still holds up well today. It's unlikely you'll find a system that hasn't been overclocked to hell and back, but they all still seem to be here, and they all still seem to be working. So there we have it. AMD's cheapest and lowest end FX chip tested after years and years from its release. I mean, 12 years ago, where's the time gone? It launched with little fanfare and went completely under the radar, other than those that wanted a really cheap system back in the day, and got drawn in by those promises of high clock speeds and the fact it was dirt cheap compared to Intel's offerings. Those that couldn't afford to stretch the 6 or 8 core options. And you know what? I'm impressed. I went into this expecting Core 2 quad style performance that is just about outdated, yet we saw Core i5 levels. The same passable performance it offered 12 years ago, it can still churn out today, and that is something that deserves just a little bit of praise. I hope you've all enjoyed this rather nice look back at AMD's FX4300, the processor that started this channel, and our 200th video now. It seems appropriate that we've looked back on this and found out that AMD's FX, it was never good, but it was average. And even today, it's still managing to hang in there being average. Thank you all very much for watching, and good night.